and welcome to the MBOM podcast, where you'll learn to master the business of yoga. MBOM is a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith. I'm a 500 hour registered yoga teacher, a yoga business coach, and a total business geek. Here at MBOM, you'll learn everything you need to know to create a sustainable yoga business by learning from myself and guests from around the world about how they built their yoga businesses and about how you too can become a successful yoga teacher, studio owner, and much more. All right, let's dive in. Hey friends, I just wanted to pop in and talk a little bit about MBO behind the scenes. When I entered the yoga world as a teacher, I was surprised by how many yoga teachers were struggling with the business side of yoga. And that's why I created MBO. MBOM helps yoga teachers and studio owners become entrepreneurs. It helps you to go from surviving to thriving with your yoga business. I am on a mission to change the yoga industry, to teach yoga teachers and studio owners about the business of yoga, and to help you feel more confident, successful, and abundant. After releasing hundreds of podcast episodes, I want to create content that dives deeper into helping yoga entrepreneurs thrive and elevate their businesses. This is where MBOM Behind the Scenes comes in. Each week, you will get bonus content from the weekly guest or myself, diving deeper into how you can take the teachings and apply them to your business. This podcast is designed for yoga teachers and studio owners who are ready to take it to the next level. If you enjoy MBOM and have been looking for an affordable way to learn more, this is it. For the cost of two lattes per month, you will get never before heard content that you can't access anywhere else that will give you tangible ways to dive deeper into your yoga business. If this sounds like something you're interested in, let's dive in. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga and sign up to get behind the scenes now. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash MBOM yoga to get all the exclusive behind the scenes content. I'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the MBOM podcast. I am so grateful that you are joining me for today's episode of the show. And today on the podcast, I am very excited to be joined by Tara Stiles. Tara is a wellness expert, best selling author, and the founder of Strala Yoga. The Strala approach combines yoga, tai chi, and traditional Chinese and Japanese medicine to help people release stress, heal, let go of negative habits, and move more easily through everyday challenges. She is also the author of a number of different books, including her her brand new book, Clean Mind, Clean Body, A 28-Day Plan for Physical, Mental, and Spiritual Care. And on this episode of the show, we are diving into a little bit about Tara's backstory, how she got into yoga, why she decided to become a yoga teacher. And then we talk a little bit about creating her business, Strala, the evolution of growing that to be an internationally recognized brand, as well as some of the biggest business lessons that she's learned throughout her journey. We also talk a little bit about her book and where everyone can go to find it. It sounds like it's a really amazing book and I can't wait to get my hands on it. So Tara and I are covering a lot in this episode and I know that you're going to love it. But before we get into the episode, I just wanted to give a little shout out to Offering Tree. Offering Tree is the sponsor of this episode of the podcast, and they are your one-stop shop for all things yoga business. This includes your website, your email list, your schedule, your booking system, your payments, online courses, memberships, and more. They are continually evolving to meet the needs of yoga teachers and wellness entrepreneurs, which is why I am continuously recommending them. So You'll hear a little bit more about them a little bit later on and where you can go to check them out. And without further ado, let's dive into the interview. Here's Tara. Welcome to the podcast today, Tara. I'm really excited to have you here with me today. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat about everything. Yeah, I'm so excited to dive into all things having to do with Strala and your business and all the great things that you're doing in the yoga world. But I think a good place to start is your yoga story. Can you tell me a little bit about how you first got into yoga? Uh, Sure. Well, I think, you know, it, it, it feels at least the more people share their stories of yoga, the more kind of uh, normal or relatable. I think all of our stories are are similar in in a certain way, but I danced growing up and I thought that would be my life doing contemporary modern and ballet, that kind of a thing. But my whole life, my parents were kind of uh, straight edge hippies. I thought they were very boring because they did the conservation of energy thing. And, you know, we lived with not a lot of money and grew our food and that kind of stuff, but they didn't do any of the 
kind of rock and roll and drugs and that whole lifestyle. So I thought I was really missing out. Um, but, but in my dance program, I was a teenager and I got, you know, super lucky or synchronicitous or however that kind of works out. But my ballet teacher, Rory Foster, was in American Ballet Theater in New York City in the 70s. And he got into yoga there and then. So he brought it into our dance program. And at that time, it was still, you know, not really in programs like that or not in schools. And, you know, that wasn't, you know, something kind of happening then. So I remember seeing this yoga teacher for the first time sitting at the front of the room. He was a kind of happy looking person. And I thought this is that feeling that I had growing up doing all of these conservation of energy practices with my family. And he exuded this kind of happiness for no reason at all. <laughs> and then when he led us through this class, I thought, my goodness, here is the secret to life. Here's this process to improve, you know, on all of these raw feelings I have inside and I'm kind of hooked for life. And, you know, back then, you know, I, I thought this person was the only person that did this as a teaching and I had no idea that yoga could be a job or nor did I want it to be a job for my life. But my first thought was, this is amazing. I feel so great. And I want to keep finding the people teaching these things and these kinds of things my whole life and use this as a personal tool. But then I had a second thought, which was, why don't all my friends do this? <laughs> so I kind of got, you know, a roundabout way drawn back into just asking my friends why they don't practice yoga, whether it was they hadn't heard of it or they found it intimidating or, you know, they uh, had misconceptions that were based in reality, turns out, or all of these reasons. So I, I started kind of digging in and discovering and, and going to different places to learn different healing modalities. And, and the more I started learning, the more I just wanted to share with people um, to help them essentially feel better. Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. And I also came from a dance background too. And that's the first time I tried yoga. And I remember feeling like, what is this like weird <laughs> stretchy thing that we're doing? And I was in high school, so it was extremely mm, cool. flexible and that type of thing and kind of felt like, oh, it's not that hard. And it was a couple of years later that I really felt like I got into yoga a bit more. So it's, it's cool to hear like the alignment with that. And I think as I've done yoga more too, I've really felt that like, why aren't all my friends doing this? Like, <laughs> why does it, why is not everybody not doing this? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it was definitely a pickle for me. And I'm sure you have similar, this is why I love sharing stories. Cause we all have kind of the same story, different variations, but you know, I found out my friend's you know, they'd go to a place once and and it would smell funny back then, or, you know, now it's, you know, overly commercial now, but it's sort of back then it was the whole place was covered in incense. And there was a strange person asking me to go to their house afterwards. And I'm like, yeah, I understand why you didn't want to go back to that. <laughs> so there was, you know, all of these kind of um, individual experiences that weren't really a unified way, at least showing people that they could do yoga in a way that felt good for them and not taking them away from who they are as you know, a person. So, you know, there was, and there still is always, I think with everything, but so much room to, to grow and for individual people to share in a way that's authentic to them, to help people who identify with, you know, each kind of, you know, avatar teacher. And we're all kind of avatars right now on our screens, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's, there's definitely so much room to, to have the relatability of yoga reach more people. Yeah, a hundred percent. I completely agree with that. And I'd love to hear a little bit about like that journey for you becoming a yoga teacher and then into your career. What was it that kind of inspired you to go from like, okay, I love this practice, more people should be doing it to like, okay, I'm going to be the person to like bring this to other people. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to do it, to be honest. It was, it was definitely a feeling of an internal pull that I was resisting. So I was definitely searching and looking for all the places to, to find out about yoga and to go to different workshops and events that were happening. Um, you know, back then I had no idea what a yoga teacher training was. There weren't, you know, there weren't really a lot of them that I was aware of, at least. Um, I moved to New York and was doing a lot of um, dance gigs and some TV commercials and stuff like that. And um, one of the gigs I had was being in this ad for Crunch Gym and they threw in a gym membership for me. And I was like, well, do you guys have you know, yoga classes there. And they said, oh yeah, we do. And I thought, well, this is kind of, you know, cutting edge. There's not really yoga at gyms back then yet. So there was a bunch of teachers there and they were all really individual and amazing and they were nice people. And I thought this is so cool. I was kind of looking for, 
for that. And um, one of them, Amy Impolity, she still teaches a lot of trainings. She uh, handed me a flyer and she said, you know, I think you should come to my training program. And I'm like, wow, there's a flyer. There's a program. This is cool. So I said, well, I don't, I don't want to teach yoga. I'm doing all these other things, but I, you know, I'd love to go and attend and just, you know, do I have to, I remember asking her a question, like, do I have to, you know, is there a requirement to teach yoga after this or do some sort of program? She's like, no, no, you can do whatever you want. So I remember going to her program, just really liking her and her energy and her individuality of how she expressed yoga. And as soon as I got into that program, I thought, well, this is interesting. And the style she was teaching, you know, I thought was very different than how I ever experienced yoga. And I, I, so I started to see how many different variations there can be. And, you know, I just remember sitting in that program thinking, well, if she can do it in this way, maybe there's an opportunity or possibility If I want to share with um, my friends, I can share my understanding of yoga in my own way. So I was just kind of thinking about it a lot, but again, no plans to, to kind of do that. But then I got kind of pulled in because I was always talking about yoga to everybody I would meet that didn't do it, you know, whether it was somebody out at an event or at a photo shoot or a TV commercial, whether it was, you know, the, the guy holding the camera or the craft service gal. And I'm like, oh, if you're stressed out, you should do yoga. <laughs> you know, So I started getting invited to, to lead people one-on-one in their houses. And I wasn't doing it for money. They would try to give me money. And I was like, no, no, I, I, I don't want to take your money because then I have to actually be good at this. <laughs> so I did that for a long time just for fun. And, uh, started making videos on YouTube when YouTube happened. And this was 2006. So I remember all the people I met from that teacher training saying to me, you can't put yoga on the internet. This is not okay. It has to be 90 minutes in a studio with a teacher. And I just remember thinking, okay, this is obviously going to change. Yoga is going to change. And okay, fine. I can be part of maybe one of those people that can, can change it in a way to maybe crack it open, um, from being more kind of insular and, you know, in small groups that are really, you know, um, just talking to each other to, to just people talking to people. So I thought, okay, there's, there's a good sign that there's some resistance. People don't understand how I want to share this but they'll understand in five years when more than just me is doing it. (laughs) So I started doing that and started leading a free class in Central Park. I literally sewed a sign because I'm kind of crafty like that. I said free yoga over here. And that was really fun. People would just walk by and come to class. And, you know, when the, when the weather started becoming fall and winter, I needed a space. So I, at my boyfriend and husband at the time had a slightly larger living room than I did. So I, I convinced him to to borrow the space to start a small studio. And from there, it just became, um, you know, the thing that I was doing with more of my time than anything else. And people were really enjoying it, enjoying how I was leading. And I remember just kept saying, well, this is how yoga should be. This isn't a big deal. And everybody that came to uh, my classes would say, no, 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 this is very different than all of the other yoga. You know, this is different. And I remember feeling, you know, not wanting to be you know, branded as so contrary, but also realizing that yoga needs to become something that helps you feel better instead of all of these people that were coming to my classes were not feeling good when they went to something else. So I knew there was something there to explore and, you know, I kind of got sucked in. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And so what year was this when you were starting to teach online? 2006. (laughs) So you must have been like one of the first people doing that. Yeah, that was it. I mean, literally there was the internet and, you know, there was AOL and there was whatever Yahoo or Gmail had just started. Facebook had just, I think maybe 2008 was Facebook. I'm not quite sure of the history of Facebook, but we had a Facebook page. We didn't have a website. We had a Facebook page eventually um, and a front door. And it was literally just word of mouth. Somebody would come And they would like the class. They'd come back the next day with two more friends. And then we had, you know, the living room can only fit 20 people. So then eventually we had to, you know, rent a space and, um, you know, get a a, a more bigger, you know, floor, I guess. (laughs) So, So, yeah, it was online and in person at the same time. And for me, I saw it as two very different um, um, ways to reach people. I mean, people online were whoever they were, but, you know, a lot of my friends back home and then eventually people around the world that I would get to meet some of them in person, which was cool. But that also led me to 
um, writing about yoga for different magazines at the time, you know, people would see, you know, I would do a video like, Hey, if your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you, here's a five minute yoga routine that can help you feel better. And that was like cutting edge at the time. (laughs) It was like, that was rebellious, you know, I got a lot of, uh, you know, nasty phone calls from friends being like, yoga is not, you can't just say, do these poses and this will help. And I would say, yeah, of course, but you know, nobody takes that literally. It's about sitting down with yourself, taking time to feel better. So you create a lifestyle, but you don't need to, at least in my kind of feeling still is you don't need to, you know, essentially yell at people that they need to do this rigid thing in a rigid way in order to feel better. So, you know, for me at the time, it was just the door was wide open to, to do this stuff and say this stuff. And every time I did, it helped people feel better. So I just kind of, I kept getting more opportunities to write blogs and, and, and write my first book at the time. Um, so, you know, more opportunities to work with, uh, Um, different people for DVDs. I got to meet Jane Fonda and Deepak Chopra and and do a bunch of projects. And, you know, so people were finding me and saying to me, like, I know you're getting a lot of kind of flack from your yoga friends, but keep doing what you're doing and let me help you also along the way. So, you know, eventually I think people in the yoga community saw, okay, the internet is not the enemy. It's, um, you know, how we, how we share what we share. Maybe we need to look at that a little bit more and be a little less insular and a little less secretive maybe, and see maybe why we're being secretive and what's the problem. And, you know, there's an opportunity for for everybody to kind of turn around and open up a little bit more to the, to the human community, not just the yoga community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting because I feel like it's such a different world from kind of the yoga world we're living in now. And, I think there's a part of me that's like, I feel like it would have been so amazing to be, or so interesting to be a teacher at this time. And I've talked to, you know, lots of other yoga teachers who were really like a a part of this, this movement growing, especially in the West, like Canada, the U S and, and whatnot. And they've talked about how, you know, workshops didn't just fill and there weren't like a bunch of people who just knew what yoga was. Like you had to do a lot of legwork to sell it, but it also sounds like it was a really interesting time to be a yoga teacher and kind of you know, get people understanding about this amazing practice. So just wanted to touch on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think for me, it was, I wasn't really interested in taking people away from their beloved yoga teacher. I was more talking to like the doorman and the guy walking down the street and, and the, you know, word of mouth really is wonderful. Even for online, somebody likes your online yoga class. They're literally going to tell not even their 10 in-person friends, but their thousand, you know, Instagram friends now, and you're going to find more people from that. But, you know, I think it's really cool, you know, whether it's then or now there's, there's so many people, everybody wants to feel better. And I think if you teach something, whether it's yoga or anything else in the way that you actually want to help them, like I didn't care to educate them about yoga. I wanted to help people feel better through this cool process of yoga and yoga was just there they don't need to read 10 books about it. They can do this thing. And then they're like, oh, I'm doing yoga. <laughs> you know? So it was, you know, it was, it was a really great time because, you know, yoga still had this, I mean, I think it still does like a bad reputation. And I was, you know, a, a few people were also saying like, Hey guys, like cut it out. Like you can't be doing this stuff. You can't be, you know, worshiping these gurus. You can't be, you know, not speaking up when somebody's being abused and all of this stuff. And, you know, at least at that time, you know, I was told to be quiet and I wasn't quiet. I just went over and started my own thing, you know, but it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to go against what everyone else is doing. And I think there's, I don't, I don't think necessarily it's about that time, but it's, you know, like, like right now, it's hard to go against all of the trends happening now, you know, the superficiality with overly curated and, you know, flexibility pictures and being about the body and, you know, all of the other kind of weird things happening in the wellness community at large. Like there's always, it's always hard to feel like you're the only one saying, no, there's got to be a better way, but, but it's worth it. You know, I think, cause you're not alone and people want, people want that better way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of going from there, can we talk a little bit about creating your business Strala and, and what the evolution of that was? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, it kind of happened by accident. It was never a business plan. I've always just loved 
creating things. So I think it's part of who I am naturally. And I, 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 I know enough about myself to know that I need to know myself in order to be, you know, effective, I guess. Um, so I'm totally comfortable in, you know, whether you want to call it uncertainty or not knowing or whatever it is in the middle of, of doing something like a process like that. So, you know, I, I led a class, people wanted to come back and had an excitement. They were mirroring back to me the same excitement, the same energy that I felt. So I knew that what, what I was doing was useful to a certain amount of people so that I just needed to find different ways to express that or sustain it. It didn't need a business plan or a spreadsheet to do that or outside funding to do that. It needed me to keep doing what I'm doing and to see kind of where it was going to be able to direct that kind of more effectively. So yeah, I started a studio in, in Mike's apartment at the time and, and people would come and you know, we would just put a few classes on the schedule and then more people would come. Um, you know, we do some workshops and people would come, which was nice, but, you know, I never, I never did more than I thought people would want to do. And I think that's kind of, you know, my own way of, of sort of doing things. I don't kind of overreach or I just, I like to do things and then kind of see what happens. Um, I didn't want to have a teacher training program in the beginning. I thought that was ridiculous. But the more people started coming, they would go to their classes and lead in a similar way. And, I, and they kept saying, well, you know, what, what's going on? And at that point, you know, 2006, it was a laboratory. I'm thinking, well, you know, there's a little bit of softness, there's ease, there's moment to moment movement instead of pose based. So there's some stuff here, but I need, I need time and I need my other teachers to have time to actually figure out what this is and what we're doing before you know, we just, you know, slap up some trainings on the schedule because people want to come. I just didn't think that that would be uh, fun for me or sustainable for anyone. So, you know, we just started doing things very gradually and, you know, it's, it, it, it went, fa it went faster than I even wanted it to go, which I think happens when you do things not in an overreaching way. So um, we started, as soon as we opened up a, a proper training program, um, people came from all around the world and it was literally hilarious. We'd be sitting in New York city with, you know, a few people from New York city. And then we'd have like Germany and, you know, Southeast Asia and Japan, Indonesia and South America and all over Europe, you know, in the UK and all over America and Canada, all in one room. And I'm like, New York is amazing because people actually want to come to New York to do other things. So I don't think it was just the yoga, but also it was kind of really cool to see the community that had built online or just showed up online that was so excited and they wanted to come and be a part of something together. So for me, for Strala is, you know, it's about how I like to lead yoga, but it's not about me personally. It's about our community and it's about how we lead. So, you know, I love seeing the, we call our teachers guides. We like to call ourselves that just feels more authentic for us. Um, we all sort of value and prioritize leading for the same reasons. You know, we want to help people feel better. That's really a kind of core value that we all share. Um, we want to lead with softness and not rigidity. You know, we care about the whole self and not superficiality and all of these things. And it's not like I have to teach people those things. It's because I'm doing my best to lead those things. And then the people that want to be a part of that just find each other. And I think because of that, it's been our kind of secret weapon. We, we haven't had to do any weird or any business strategies at all, you know, to be sustainable and to grow and to, you know, to have a vibrant um, business and community, not just for me and for my part of the business, but for all of our uh, teachers and guides and partner studios and people taking their classes all around the world as well. So I've learned so much through that process, but I really just, for me, think it comes down to the how I want to feel and how I want to lead and letting all of my sort of choices and decisions fall in line with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's really inspiring to hear. And I feel like you touched on a lot of really beautiful stuff there, but one thing I want to pull from that is just what you said at the end around the way you lead and, and the way you, you run your business and inspire the people that you work with and the guides and the leaders and the partner studios. And I think that that's something that's really important to remember for anyone who is working with other people. I think as yoga teachers, we're often solopreneurs, but as we we grow, we bring people onto our teams, even if it's just, you know, an assistant or something like that. And the way that you lead is really a reflection of your business. And 
the way that other people kind of see that business. And I think that when there's somebody who kind of leads through the practices and principles and philosophies of yoga, people are attracted to that. So not only were you online, which a lot of people weren't in, in some cases that allowed you to grow this international brand. But I think there's also this important key piece here that is the leadership behind it and, and using these practices and philosophies to be a good leader that attracts other people. Yeah, totally. And I think it's, it's, it's so easy to not do that. I mean, all the business people I've met along the way who've been like, Oh, let's do this together. Let's do this together have not aligned with that idea. And they think what I'm talking about is, is naive almost, but I'm like, I don't need the capital to grow the business because everything's sustainable because I'm doing things this way. And I don't know everything obviously, but it's, it's, it's been much more enjoyable to be a part of things this way. And I think that's a hard, um, it's not a hard path to take. It's for me, it's the only path to take, you know, I'm happy to do partnerships and work with people, but it's really easy to decide what's right and what's wrong because, you know, it feels right. And I think, you know, it's amazing to have a business based in something that's also a practice because if it doesn't match up, you, you're going to know it, you're going to feel it. And then you have a decision, you know, which direction to go. Maybe your practice is off. Maybe you're practicing, you know, fear and you're practicing, you know, not being happy where you are until you get somewhere else. And then in that case, maybe it's a good lesson for you to adjust how you practice or what you're actually sharing. And I see that so much because you're totally right. You know, how you practice is how you lead. And, you know, if you're, I think you can lead a high intensity yoga class, but you can also be a good person if you're doing that in a nice way. But if you do that in a way that's, you know, forcing and being angry and screaming at yourself, then how are you not going to do that in the rest of your life? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's kind of a really cool way to, to talk about business is, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it's, you can't escape yourself. I think you'd have to be a really good compartmentalizing you know, person, I don't know, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not an actress. You know, I can't do that. I just have to be myself and improve and, and learn from my mistakes and kind of go from there. But, you know, thank goodness, because anything else seems exhausting. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I really love that. And I love how you speak about business specifically. And one thing I like to think about when I'm working with yoga teachers and, and studios is like, I can teach you tools that can help you with your business, but you're the only one who can know if these tools are right for your business because it is very heart-centered, right? And it needs to feel good at the end of the day. And I feel like one of the things that kind of turns, I think, yoga teachers off specifically from this business side of things is this idea that we have to do things a certain way. We have to follow these models to make money. We have to do sales in a certain way. And it's like, no, you don't have to do anything in a way that doesn't feel good for you because it's your business and you get to bring your principles into your business there are certain tools that you can learn. And then from that toolbox, you can choose what tools you want to use and how you want to use them. And so I always think about coming back, like getting out of the head, which is so hard and into the heart to really allow that heart-centered business to shine through. Oh, I love that you share that because I think that's the secret to, to all of this so much is, yeah, if you, if you do what makes sense for you and feels good for you, then, you know, and also you know, people love to throw around all of the, you know, manifesting and getting what you want, but, you know, all of that stuff becomes more grounded in reality when you, when you're not fooling yourself or you're not lying to yourself, or you're not trying to trick, you know, your, your potential customer, all of those kinds of things, you know, when you're actually doing the thing that you love doing, you know, things happen easier. It's just nature, just, you know, like you plug in a cord to an electric socket. We don't have to be like, Ooh, it's, magical. It's just electricity. <laughs> you know, it's, it's magical that it was invented, but, but, you know, I think, I think all of that stuff is just so, I love that you do that because it kind of normalizes being a good person. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks for saying that. I feel like, yeah, being a good person is more important to me than pretty much anything else in this world. And I know it's hard. Like it's, it's, I mean, it's easy, right. But it's also like hard to kind of you know, figure out what that means, I guess, for ourselves, because we're always going to have sort of these differing values and, and things around what we think is a good person. Like somebody might be doing something where you're like, whoa, 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 I would never do that. And you have to acknowledge like, okay, they're doing what they're doing. That's not what I'm going to do. This is what feels good for me. 
Oh yeah. Especially. And I mean, that's why when you said earlier, you know, it must've been so nice to teach yoga then it, it, it was in so many ways because there was no one to look at, you know, if you wanted to look at someone else, you had to go outside, <laughs> you know, like there wasn't these screens in front of us where people were all trying to do things, you know, immediately and become experts in them in the same moment and, you know, make sure they looked a certain way. There just wasn't that. So, you know, it doesn't mean that life didn't exist, but, you know, you had more time. And I think now you have to purposefully put down the distractions in that way. And, you know, and, and whatever it is that you do to, to feel like yourself and, you know, yeah, from there it's easier. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's really, really good point. And it's so hard these days. I mean, I go on social media and I just feel like when I go on Facebook, I'm just bombarded by like all the other people who are doing really like truly amazing things, but it just feels so overwhelming because then my brain's immediately like, you're not doing enough. Oh, they're doing something similar to you. Like, is yours thing good enough? And, you know, a million things run through my head and then I go on Instagram and it's, you know, the same thing. And I think that we really have to work to not get caught up in that. We have to work at keeping our head in our own lane wishing other people well for the work that we're doing and really just focusing on ourselves and, and our businesses. And that is like freaking hard. Like it's not easy to do that. Yeah. I think if everybody could just go back in a time machine with me to 2006 and just like have a month, you know, inside of, of our own apartments, just like doing our things, writing on a paper calendar, what we want to do, and then be transported back to here. Maybe it'll be a little bit easier, but I think, you know, we can, we can have those moments now. And I think even people, you know, my age slowly, like the cooking frog kind of just get into it and get attached to the phone too. So I don't even think it's necessarily that time, but we have to, you know, sort of curate that for ourselves. And, and I think what's so cool is when you, when you actually really get that confidence, you, you just, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, you can laugh at certain people or, you know, like you said, wish them well, or not be so aggravated or intensified or whatever, all of the, you know, the addictive washing machine feelings that people have and just, you know, say, okay, I can, I can do my own thing. And that's actually the best thing for everybody. <laughs> So. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. If you find that time machine and we can go back to 2006. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah hit me, hit me up. I'm in a hundred percent. in. <laughs> I'll show you what my flip phone work looked like. And my, uh, oh, I had one of those flip cams. Those were cool. <laughs> oh, that's pretty <laughs> sweet. Plug them yeah. into a USB port. <laughs> I think I had my first phone in 2006, uh, because I was still in high school and I got one when I started driving. So I think I got a phone in 2005, but it's funny oh. to think about, cause it was like, a really old school flip phone and basically like none of my friends used phones. So I would just turn it off and like mm -hmm. leave it in the car all day. And it's funny because my parents would actually get upset that they couldn't reach me. Like <laughs> we bought you this phone, you've wanted one for years and now you're just like turning it off and leaving it in the car. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I can't have it in school anyways. None of my friends have them. It's not like I can do anything with it. <laughs> so the only point is to have it to drive. And that was probably me from yeah 2005 to 2007 when I went into university. Amazing. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> wild to think about because now I just feel like I feel like my phone is like my third arm, you know, mm. like I don't go anywhere without my third arm. It's always with me. <laughs> Amazing. Well, it does more now. It just flipped open then and, you know, could dial your parents. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Now it's like my little mini computer. It's, it's pretty incredible really, but it, it can certainly have its downsides. And now it's time for a short break from the show to talk about our sponsor offering tree. If you're interested in finding an all-in-one platform for online or in-person teaching, then you should definitely check out Offering Tree. Offering Tree set out to make creating your digital presence fun, easy, and affordable. With one click, you can build a website, run online or in-person live classes, sell pre-recorded classes, manage memberships and packages, and much more. Communicating with your students is seamless and easy with their automated email system and email marketing tools already have your own website? No problem, because Offering Tree can embed seamlessly into your existing website. They're always adding new features to their platform to make it even better. They just recently released the online store feature that lets you easily sell digital content like yoga videos, challenges, and courses right from your website. 
If you're looking for a single platform to take care of all of your online and in-person teaching needs, then visit offeringtree.com forward slash MBM. Offering Tree has been supporting MBM for over a year now, and I not only love the product, but I also love the people. Offering Tree is providing special pricing for MBM listeners, so be sure to visit offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM. That's offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM to receive the discount. All right, now back to the episode. Um, I would love to dive into a little bit of the the business lessons you've learned. And I know you've had a very like vast career and you've done a lot of different things. And I think something that could be interesting for people to hear because you've been doing this online thing for so long is just some of the biggest lessons you've learned about running an online business. Because these days, I think most yoga teachers are at least dabbling in an online business, if not running their own businesses. And you've been doing this for way longer than I think probably anyone out there listening. If somebody out there has been running a business for longer than 2006, send me an email. I would love to chat with you. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. That'd be amazing. Me too, by the way. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think the strange thing about my experience was in the beginning, it, it, it's, it, it wasn't, there was no point, there was no goal for it to be a business. I mean, YouTube didn't have any way for anything to be a business. It was literally just, um, I had something inside of me that I needed to get out and share. And what, what started to become more traction was when people started to watch. And you know, the, the whole goal of making videos online for me at that time was to meet people in real life. So I wanted it to translate, but it started to lead to more um, digital opportunities. So I got to blog for Huffington Post regularly. And I think what really, um, what I learned about the internet and, and sort of, um, my message or sharing was being regular. So actually one of the gals that came to the studio got me blogging for Huffington Post. She was the editor for the health section. And she said, it's so boring. It's the worst section. It's just, you know, a bunch of, you know, 65 plus AARP articles. And I'm like, well, that's cool, you know, but she said they wanted to make it younger and more fun. So I said, okay, I'd love to, you know, do some regular blog posts that I would then kind of embed a video or whatever. So I did that regularly, which led me to being able to work for Men's Health Magazine and Women's Health Magazine, where I got to kind of, you know, jump around my ideas. I had this idea for a little online show called uh, Yoga Emergency, where people would call me with their, you know, tight hamstrings or their headache or their boss being mean. And then I would, you know, get on my flip phone (laughs) and then talk to them and then run out to their office or whatever and do a little yoga video. So, you know, but but the thing I learned about Um, it it turning into, I guess, a business, but something that was starting to take up more of my time and eventually becoming a business was being regular. So, you know, I started putting up a video every week, just fun. And, you know, I didn't, it it wasn't hard for me to come up with ideas because it was, again, there was nobody to look at. And I thought, well, I had this idea of yoga for everything. And it was sort of like yoga for, you know, the breakup and yoga for, you know, jocks and yoga for runners. And there's, you know, basically that you can do that for a million years. <laughs> so I thought, okay, this can be, you know, for forever. And as long as I'm having fun, then there's something for me to do. So, you know, I think now, you know, online, whether, you know, people have an app or, you know, they're charging for their videos or whatever it is, I think that regularity is is really important, whether you're giving it away for free or, or paid or whatever. Um, and I also think treating it like, um, no different than if it was in person. I mean, we have an, our Strala app now. We've had all of our, you know, more professional looking videos available online for a long time, but now everything's on, you know, Apple TV and Roku and all of those places that exist now. Um, but we also treat it like a regular studio. We have hundreds of videos and retreats and teacher trainings you can go and do there. And we do them together as a group for, you know, some, some in-person trainings, but then we have a regular studio. So I lead classes just like I would at at the studio six days a week. And we have workshops on the weekend. So for me, I think the lesson I learned is there's, there shouldn't be a lot of difference between your online and your in-person. And, and at least that's worked for, for me and also our larger Strala community. I mean, we even have this kind of silly tagline before the pandemic. It really um, was, was not as, troubling of a tagline. It wasn't anything we use kind of professionally, but it was just our kind of internal um, joke or mantra. And it was online is great, but in person is magic. (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. So that in person kind of went away and we realized in person, of course, is magic, but online is great. So, you know, it's sort of treating both as the same and, and not distancing yourself too far from yourself. I mean, I get, I get confused when I meet somebody in person at a training and, you know, their name is different if they have this big online presence, but it sort of doesn't match who they feel like in person. At least for me, there's a big disconnect. I mean, there is a disconnect and it's hard for me to um, understand what they're doing or who this person is, or if they want to have any kind of in-person presence. So I think maybe that's a good takeaway is, is don't spend, um, don't try to make something of yourself digitally that you aren't in real life. And I think people want to know you and it's why people are so fascinating. Everybody's incredible and special and interesting. And if you work on yourself and have something to share, you know, don't be afraid to actually, you know, it sounds so corny, but show yourself. You don't need to, you know, curate and and all of these treat yourself like an art gallery. You know, you wouldn't do that in person. You would just be you, you would show up and, you know, take a shower or whatever, but, but you don't need to have these two separate kind of identities. And I think that's kind of confusing when people do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a really good point. I think that with all the wild stuff that's flying around these days on the internet, I think sometimes it's easy to feel like who you are is maybe not enough for the internet, Mm -hmm. but I think more than ever, like people crave real people and connections. And I think that it's kind of scary when you've been like talking to somebody online and then you meet them in person and you're like, Oh, have I like let them down in some way? Like, (laughs) like I've met like listeners of my podcast and both this one and my travel podcast that I co-host with my husband. And the first couple of times it happens, it's like, what if we're not like the people they think we are? And it's like, no, like if you've been listening to me talk for hours and hours, like that's just me talking, you know, it's like exactly who I am in person. But it is kind of scary to think of like, oh, have I created a persona for like my Mm -hmm. online business that's not actually who I am in all facets of my life. And I think that we really do have to remember that our message and our voice and our brand is who we are and that we need to come back to that. Like, am I speaking my truth here? Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm so glad that you share that too. So many people are, I think, just confused by that because you see somebody and you think you need to be like them or look like them or talk like them or wear like them or what, you know, all down the rabbit hole with that. And yeah, it's just, you know, at least in my opinion, a complete waste of your precious time and your unique energy and, and what you have to share. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing those, those business tips and business lessons. Do you have any other lessons from your career that you want to share today? Oh gosh. Well, I think this is, you know, again, kind of looking around at where, where I think people go wrong and, you know, this is just something in life, but, you know, for me, everything is the same. You know, I kind of, I don't have a business personality and then a life personality. It sounds like you're the, you're the same as me in that way too, but I just think being, being a good person as much as you can and, you know, getting up every day, taking good care of yourself. So when you go, you know, if you have a meeting or you have a partnership or whatever, you're, you're feeling good. So you're not going to, you're not going to be rude or you're not going to be, you know, uh, judgmental or you're not going to ask for something you don't deserve yet or whatever it is. But I, I just think, you know, as much as you can take good care of yourself, so you feel good when you walk into any room, at least, you know, that you're going to be good to all those people. And, you know, I worked with Reebok for five years, you know, several years ago, and we created this whole yoga apparel line together that, you know, changed my life and changed their company. And we did so much cool stuff and we really extended the contract many times. And, you know, I think my experience there was so great because, you know, every person I would meet, I would, I would talk to, and whether it was the janitor or the CMO of the company. And, you know, sometimes the janitor becomes the CMO of the company. And if you're just actually being a good person because you care about yourself and you care about people, then that always comes back around. And, you know, I have so many wonderful, you know, personal close relationships with people I've met, you know, at, at many different companies, you know, whether I was doing something for free as a volunteer or, you know, getting paid to do something, you know, in a more structured way. I think just, you know, if people can just do what you need to do to feel good. So every day that you go out and talk to somebody and represent yourself, you're going to, you're going to be proud of what you do and proud of what you say. I think that's, you know, you can't 
walk back, you know, some of those mistakes. So I think that's, you know, something that people maybe could take a little something from. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know Tara, you just wrote a new book, clean mind, clean body, a 28 day plan for physical, mental, and spiritual self-care, which sounds absolutely amazing, especially with all the craziness going on in the world right now. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about that and, and where people can go to find it. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, it really came out of an observation and, you know, my own desire to slow down in my practice and not in a slow down to do nothing kind of way, but slow down to achieve more and kind of looking at where the wellness industry is now and sort of, you know, almost going to, I don't know if this is a word that people are using yet, but I would sort of see fast wellness, you know, in New York city, there'd be a 15 minute acupuncture place. Then you go and you get your green juice, then you toss it out in the trash and you go to your yoga class and sort of outsourcing all of our, our wellness in a way. And, you know, I don't say that to make fun of anybody, but it's sort of where we were all kind of in this energy of moving faster and things, not um, being able to digest and rest in our own, in our own experiences. So, you know, I wanted to take people on on a journey of a lot of the ancient wisdoms that we're all a lot more familiar with now, thankfully, because of the internet, like yoga, meditation, and Tai Chi, and Shiatsu, and Ayurveda, and just show how they can be a process that you can learn about and do your whole life, but you can do them now in a way that respects your own situation, your own family's rituals and cultures. You don't have to move further away from your own identity to respect the culture that these things came from and have them actually be meaningful in your life and, and help you feel better. So that's um, sort of that journey going through all of those different uh, wisdoms. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I, I can't wait to check it out. And if people want to get their hands on a copy, where can they find that? Uh, should be anywhere books are available, but an easy place that kind of sends you to all the places. If people are looking is just terrastyles.com. That's just my simple kind of author website there. So people can check that out. Awesome. And then if people want to follow along with your journey, maybe check out Strala, where can they find all of that? Uh, sure. From terrastyles.com links kind of everywhere else as well. Or you can go to stralayoga.com. Um, we have classes online pretty much every day on the Strala Yoga app. And um, I just think the community also is amazing to meet. So if you just search the hashtag Strala Yoga on Instagram, you'll meet friends from all around the world. And something I'm really proud of in our community is it's it's inclusive. It's not sort of just if you're a Strala guide, you can hang with us. <laughs> it's, it's really about ease and feeling good and connection. So, you know, it's it's amazing for me to connect with somebody who has a completely different life, lives on the completely different side of the planet, but we both want to feel at ease and feel better. So kind of that's how we connect with each other. And I think, you know, we're all kind of craving that connection. Um, So, you know, come on and, and, and join, join the human connection. Amazing. I love that. I know I'm definitely craving that. So it sounds pretty incredible and I can't wait to learn more about it and and check it out myself. Tara, this conversation has been so awesome. I'm excited to chat more about your book behind the scenes, Um, but I think we'll wrap it up here and just want to say thank you so much for your time and for everything that you've shared today. Oh, thank you so much. Great to chat with you. All right, friends, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with Tara Styles. Make sure you go check her out and check out her new book. If you have been thinking that you might want to write a book or you have an idea that's been brewing and you just don't understand how, you know, busy yoga teachers and business owners and parents and whatnot are able to write books, I was able to pick Tara's brain a little bit about that. So in our behind the scenes episode, we dove into her process for writing her book and she has written a number of books. So she's got lots of good stuff to share. And this episode can be found over at patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga. It also gives you access to every other episode that's there. So I'd love to have you there behind the scenes. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga. As well, I'd like to give a big thank you to Offering Tree. Thank you so much to them for sponsoring this episode of the show. Make sure you guys go check them out. It's offeringtree.com forward slash MBM to get a little discount. And of course, thank you for listening to the show, for listening all the way to the end and for being here every week. I am so grateful for you. All right. Have a nice week and I'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you 
you so much for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. To find links, notes, resources, and everything mentioned in today and all episodes of the show, you can head on over to mbomyoga.com. You can find the podcast and myself on Facebook and social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. And I would love for you to join the private Facebook community, Yoga Business Badasses. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please make sure you reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. And last of all, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. It would mean the world. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Thank you.